Good evening, everyone. Welcome all. I am Jen Maxey. I am the Assistant Director of Programs at the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles. If you're joining us for the first time, we are a cultural center and a museum here in LA. We are rooted in the Jewish value, values of welcoming all, pursuing justice, and building community. I'm sure that we can all agree that food and cooking have played a huge role in our communities over this past year. Even though we haven't been able to gather, people have shared recipes, tried new things in the kitchen, been inspired by cooking demos, and very importantly, helped to ensure that those who needed food in our community received it. Jen Lewis is currently caring for nine homeless tent camps in Portland, Oregon. Two times each week, she packs a warm meal, non-perishable foods, donated clothes, sleeping bags, toiletries, batteries, and other essential items, and distributes them. With an open heart and without judgment, she believes that basic needs are human rights. Jen has connected with several food distributors and gleaners and acts as a distribution hub and redirects excess food to organizations so that people who need it can receive it. Prior to this, she enjoyed a culinary career spanning more than two decades. She has owned three highly acclaimed Portland restaurants, as well as a full service catering company. Jen competed on Bravo's Top Chef Masters and was named on the Food and Wine's Best New Chefs in 2012. Her simple, sophisticated cooking style that champions seasonal Pacific Northwest US ingredients has earned her two nominations for the James Beard Foundation Award of Best Chef Northwest. Her debut cookbook, Pasta by Hand, was nominated for an IACP from the International Association of Culinary Professionals. It was followed by the Book of Greens, which won an, an IACP award in 2017 and was nominated for a J James Beard Award. The Chicken Soup Manifesto is Jen's third book and was published in 2020. Jen is involved in nonprofits, including Alex's Lemonade, Portland Homeless Family Solutions, and Lift Urban Portland. She lives in Portland, Oregon with her three cats, Wasco, Silverado Silverstein, the best cat name ever, and Tove, and loves to garden, read, and cook for friends. Joining Jen tonight is LA's own Evan Kleinman. A self-described geeky food scholar by the age of 20, Evan has been a chef, a restaurant owner, cookbook author, and many of you may know her from her radio show, Good Food on KCRW, a show that has a worldwide audience on the web. Good Food received an IACP in 2012, and Evan was inducted into the James Beard Who's Who of Food and Beverage in America. Evan is an active speaker on culinary subjects, the founder of LA Slow Food Chapter, served on the Stewardship Council of Roots of Change, and is a member of the LA Food Policy Council. And I should add, she is a friend to the Skirball, and we're always happy to see her again. So Evan, without further ado, take it away. Thank you so much, Jen, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you to all of you who have joined us at the Skirball um, for this wonderful evening tonight. Thank you, Jen Lewis, um, for giving me this opportunity. It's been uh, a while since we've been together in a room, so this is the next best thing. Absolutely. Um, so I wanna start by saying a couple of things. Um, first of all, you'll see me look at my phone. I'm not multitasking. That's where my notes live. Um, <laughs> um, and of course, a woman who is um, bringing solace to homeless encampments would write a book about um, chicken soup. Um, I, I wanna just say that um, I come from a mom who barely cooked at all. And, um, but somehow she taught me how to make chicken soup from scratch. And I will forever be sad that I never asked her who taught her. So um, this is one of those conversations that should encourage all of us to ask questions about those who teach us things. So Jen, you say that a pot of chicken soup is the ultimate gesture of love. Was there an experience that you had or someone's pot of soup in particular that sort of gave you the spark for this investigation of chicken soups from all over the world? 
I did have an experience. I was, I was, I was a uh, working a fundraising event in uh, San Diego, and this is back in, oh gosh, uh, like 2012 in the fall. And I was coming home. No, it wasn't 2013 or 14. And I was coming home from the event and I was at the airport and all of a sudden I just didn't feel well at all. And it was like one of those quick things, like all of a sudden, like you just feel terrible. And those, that achy thing where I was kind of just trying to figure out how am I going to get home? I feel so terrible. And uh, a three hour flight was the last thing that I wanted to, to deal with at that point. And I texted my sister who's not, she can cook, but she's not like a, a huge cook. She's not, not the, the most important thing in her, her world. When I came home, she lives, she also lives in Portland. And when I came home, there was a pot of hot chicken soup on my porch. And I had the, like the achy thing where you get in the shower and your skin just hurts. And I came inside and I think I ate like three bowls of that hot soup immediately. And even though I wasn't any better physically, I felt so much better. And it just kind of kept me, got me thinking about um, what purpose it has in our world and being Jewish penicillin. And from there, I really just started to think about chicken soups. And I, I looked at all these different cultures and everyone thinks that their chicken soup is the chicken soup. So it's, it was a really interesting process of, um, of thinking about the healing uh, and, you know, every culture, there's, there's two things, two main things that people say about chicken soup all over the world in any, any culture. One is it's healing and two, you drink it for hangovers. That's what I found universal. <laughs> That's so funny. So let's start with you taking us through your own chicken soup, the chicken soup you grew up with the one that maybe your mother made and that you have made throughout your adult life? Well, it changed actually. So my chicken soup, my mom's chicken soup was pretty simple. And I actually, it's, it might be one of my favorite things that she made because it was so, so simple. Uh, it was chicken. It was making a really simple broth with chicken and carrots and onion and celery, maybe some bay leaves and cooking it till the chicken was tender and shredding the chicken into the soup. Sometimes I think there were some noodles in it. Um, she usually didn't put rice in her soup, but she always liked to uh, recite the Maurice uh, Sendak poem about uh, chicken soup with rice is really very nice. <laughs> Do you know that one? It's a whole book, it's so great. It's all about chicken soup. Um, but uh, that, was, that was kind of the thing. And sometimes she would strain it and use it more of stock and use the chicken somewhere else and uh, make matzo ball soup uh, with the broth. And that, that actually is in, in my uh, book with a plate that I, a bowl that I inherited from her when she passed away. So in the book, the picture of the soup is her recipe, the, the dish is hers. So that's one of my favorite. But I've learned to make stock in a, in a different way as I learned to cook. And most chefs don't even cook make it this way. I don't cook with any vegetables in my, in my broth. So I take chicken bones and that have still have uh, meat attached and I put them in a, a pot and I fill the water just to the top of the bones. And I usually do huge pots. So I usually do 20, 30, 40 pounds of bones at a time. And it's just that clear essence of chicken flavor. And I like that because you can you can use it anywhere. You can you can make it Asian. You can make it, um, you know, uh, Mexican. You can you can really use any any flavors in that. Um, but then I started making a double stock, so I would use that single stock then to make chicken soup, and you'd get this really rich flavor. So those are both in the in the um, book as well. And it's it's if you have time and you're able to do something like that, it's a whole different different world. So before we get into some more details about broths, and I have a lot of questions for you, I'm just curious about um, this idea of diversity within this commonality. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, it, it's probably my favorite part of, of the book. 
Um, I love traveling. I've been really fortunate to travel a lot. And um, whenever I travel, there's three things that are the most important to me to learn is uh, from the culture, is the food, the architecture, and their people. And those three are equally joyful for me. Uh, and so the book, I really, I, my geography got much stronger and uh, my understanding of geography and learning about why soups are the way that they are in different uh, countries. So thing, you know, soups like yachni, which you see in Afghanistan um, and Pakistan, it's really the same soup. The two recipes I have are, are just a little bit different, but you can really see that it is the same soup that just kind of varies from region to region. But because borders have changed so much, you know, I'm, I'm sure that at one point they were all the same uh, community. So that's one, one interesting piece. Um, another one, which is obvious, but I had to think about it a little bit, is um, the soup in Brazil is the same as the soup, or very similar to the soup in, in uh, Portugal. Well, they speak Portuguese in Brazil and there's all the, the history. So it makes sense. Um, in the uh, Philippines, there's a soup that has Chinese dumplings, fried garlic, which is a Spanish influence, and fish sauce, which is um, Filipino. And the place where the soup is from is an island that is a, uh, or a port that is a, uh, a Chinese um, shipping port. But there's all those cultures there. So as people um, cooked together or had needs, they um, created the soup and it's been part of the culture for a long time. So just kind of seeing how that um, came into play uh, all over the world was really fascinating. So let's just get the basic down about broth. Why is simmering so important versus boiling? Why do we not want to boil? Well, it, it's a couple things. If you boil stock, what happens because of the heat and intensity of the boiling, you can emulsify your, um, your, your, the, the, the liquid and the fat that, that comes off the chicken. So it becomes a greasy stock and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel great in the mouth if you're looking for a, uh, a clean stock. If you want something like ramen, that there's, there's certain types of ramen that really um, boil the stock and they want that really silky mouthfeel, that's very specific to those soups. But um, for your, your average chicken soup, you don't really wanna boil it because you don't want that greasy mouthfeel. Um, the other piece is I like to cook my chicken very, very slowly uh, so that it's, it's tender and you don't lose any of that um, silkiness, that, that tenderness as it, as it cooks and, and tenderizes. I, um, a lot of people do not like chicken breasts. And I think the reason is that they're always cooked too fast and too much heat and they seize up and they get dry and they're overcooked. But if you take a chicken breast and poach it very, very slowly in a broth, it will be a really delicious piece of, of meat. So I think it keeps the, the meat tender and juicy and it keeps your stock from getting, getting greasy. So is there a difference between stock and broth? Well, um, <laughs> I, have, I have a, uh, a page dedicated to all of the, the words that you can use for stock and broth and consomme and, and bone broth and all those things. Um, part of it is semantics. Um, there are, are little um, differences between, you know, a consomme is a clear, um, a clear broth that's made with stock. Um, but a lot of them are very similar. Like bone broth, it's pretty much stock. Um, it's, it's really nutritious because you get a lot of, uh, of marrow and collagen and all those good things uh, for your body. But um, a lot of those terms are used interchangeably these days. Excuse me. So one of the things that I'm curious about is, is there an architecture for most of the soups in which the ingredients are layered in the pot in a similar way? For example, 
are you always starting with aromatics and spices first and cooking slowly and then adding liquid and chicken? Or are you starting with the broth with liquid and chicken and then adding aromatics and, um, and other ingredients? Right. And does the architecture change from, from like continent to continent? Are there, are there um, distinctive architectures? Um, I, I've had this conversation so many times. It's, it's a really good one. Uh, I, I did go to culinary school, but I am not overly trained. And um, I, I cooked Italian food more than French food in my career or that style, I think. Um, and so I'm usually not concerned with a lot of um, formal methods. Like I think that certain things are formal methods for a reason and you have to, you know, you can't make uh, aioli or a mayonnaise in another order. It just has to be that same way for, for um, uh, reasons of emulsification. But a lot of food, like I will never go to rural, you know, some very rural place in Thailand and critique a, a person for not searing off their meat first before they put it into a broth to braise. Like it's, it, there's more than one way to get to that uh, point. So in different cultures, yes. Um, there, you know, in, in, in some cultures you start with your base and you saute onions and then you, you add your celery or maybe your carrots and that's ideally in, in France called a mirepoix. Um, and then you add your aromatics and then you might put your chicken in and, and liquid over it and, and simmer it gently. Um, other other um, cultures, uh, like in Thailand, they'll put their, in, when they make the soup, they put raw onions in the soup just as it's done before it's served. So it's, uh, you know, there, it's almost like a tea, but there's more raw flavor in the onions than if you would uh, cook a broth for a long time or a soup for a long time and all the flavor cooks out of the onion and it's much more of a cooked onion flavor than a sharp onion flavor. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, there's so much. There's um, so much, true. It was a so much. crazy project. Um, so just to get us to some, some actual specific soups, in the book, off the top of your head, what is the easiest non-European or North American soup that you would want someone to make? Uh, there's it's, it's easy answer. Um, it's the yachni from uh, Afghanistan. It's one of my favorite soups. Um, I make it all the time. It's it's cool because it's very impressive because it's so uh, unique. Um, but it really is a simple. Um, really flavorful and soulful, soulful uh, soup. It's, it's very delicious. It holds really well. I could, I could drink the broth every day. Um, it's, it's delicious. So, um, so in this picture, uh, chicken breast is used. My, uh, my friend Asia Gafarshad, she, um, uh, if, you're, if you're in Southern California and you know Claremont, her family owns Walter's, which is like the best restaurant in, in Claremont and her parents are from Afghanistan. And she taught me this soup in my kitchen at home. And I just love it. I, I love that squeeze of lemon at the end. I just love all the flavors. And I, I think I might prefer it with, um, with chicken thigh. You know, you can certainly make it with, you know, a whole chicken, but um, that, that dish is just so good. One of the things I love about that soup is the use of sour, the use of lemon. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a theme that goes through um, many of, of these soups. Um, can you think of another soup in which sour is a really um, important part of the whole? Right, um, yes, there's a, there's a bunch and, and lemon is used many different ways. Like this one is just squeezed into the soup in, um, you know, agvo lemono, which is a, a Greek soup, uh, it has such a rich, uh, uh, you take a, a, a chicken broth and then you enhance it with uh, some egg yolk and it becomes this really rich, silky soup. And then uh, it's kind of lightened up with a little bit of lemon and it's just delicious. That, um, that technique is used in 
several soups from many different parts of the world, which, mm -hmm. which I found really, really interesting. Um, and also the, the number of soups that have a bit of thickness to them, like, like this one, the water zoi. Oh, that soup is so amazing. And there's also a fish version that you see um, as well. Um, but that is just a, a, a silky, yummy, it's Belgium and it's just a delicious soup. Am I right? Belgium. Yeah, Belgium. <laughs> I, <you know. laughs> and there's one, I'm just picking, I'm just picking some that are near each other, but I found this one from Norway so interesting because of the um the inclusion of apple yes Which that one, like oh yeah that one's really cool the apple and the potato it's a whole different i mean it's a set of ingredients that they have and they can hold um there's also one um um that has banana or plantain with coconut and curry and i thought this cannot be good it is so tasty. But that one wasn't from Norway. No, but it's a, <laughs> but it's a, it's a thing though, where you have this unexpected like apple or banana and it's not something you expect with chicken soup and it works so well. So I, it would be great if we could talk about other Jewish traditions, um, other Jewish soup traditions. So here I have Gundi. Yeah, that's so cool. That is a Persian Jewish uh, dish. Uh, and it is a usually a chicken, ground chicken meatball that has the addition of chickpea flour. And you make these little meatballs and they're like, it, it, it kind of tastes like falafel. Like it's, it's, it's super yummy and herby and, and uh, really savory. One of my favorite soups from, um from that part of the world is Hawaii. You don't have a picture of it, but could you talk about it? Because I uh, think it's, it's a soup that once you start making it, there's something about it that's very um, craveable. It is, uh, there, it, it's a great soup. It's, um, I used to serve it at my Israeli restaurant that was called Ray. And uh, it, it's, it's very, it's kind of like the yachni that I said is like the go-to. It's that very, lovely, warm flavor. Um, and so a Hawaii, it's a, um, it's a Yemeni dish and it's a uh, Hawaii la Maroc. Hawaii is, means a spice mix and you can get Hawaii for coffee, which is like a, a savory kind of almost like a chai that you'd add to your coffee or you'd have Hawaii la Maroc, which is like the chicken soup. And um, it's just a really rich, combination of, of spices. So it's turmeric and cardamom and uh, coriander and cumin and all those delicious uh, warm, warm spices. And uh, it has carrots and potato and the chicken is braised in that liquid. And it's just, it's a, it's a, <clears throat> it's a full meal. And uh, Israelis uh, often will eat it for Shabbat uh, lunch. Uh, and it's, it is, it's a great soup. And you have a Sephardi matzo ball soup, which is like um, apples and oranges all together. Right. Yeah, and it has a schug, which is the uh, Yemeni hot sauce um, that is on everything. Um, but it's, it's, it's a much spicier and robust flavor. And you see those things though in Israel right now, you see you know, Israel's culture and their food culture is really, coming into its own right now and it's been doing that for a while and you see these combinations of different jewish ethnicities blending into foods so you'll see something like um you know uh like skug in something that might be more ashkenazi you'll see um like a, a beet horseradishy thing with something that's sephardic and somehow it's all working really really well um, so I just want to encourage people that if you have questions, please don't put it in the chat, put it in the Q&A, and um, I might just start pulling questions throughout our conversation and then do some additional ones at the end. Um, 
So I'm not gonna try and pronounce this one, but this is the Romanian soup that you said. Ah, uh, that's so good. Of lots of ball soup, but the dumplings was something you liked even more, if you uh, were to be honest. They are feather light. So my friend's uh, husband is from Romania. And so I, you know, I just wanted to kind of find anything that I could find with chicken soup around the world. And I asked and they sent me a name and I did a bunch of research. And basically you, you separate your, your whites and your yolks. And instead of matzo meal, you'd be using a uh, semolina, which is super, super fine uh, grain. And then you whip your egg whites until they're a stiff peak and fold them into the rest of the mixture. And you drop them into the soup really, really gently, a gentle, gentle simmer. And they're like little feathers, it, it, like little pillows. It is so delicious and so easy. And it was just one of those soups where, you know, some really make a lot of sense or I'm familiar with them. And something, some things are just brand new. And I made it and I was just in love. <laughs> so there are some soups in the book that are very brothy. Mm -hmm. In which I feel like, um, because my head sort of goes to a mise en place place where I can just say, oh, well, I want to make this soup. I have some broth already made. I can take that broth and I can put this soup together. Right. But some of the soups are more braised. They're, they're, they're still soupy, but they, they have a kind of more stew yes. profile. And for those, it seems like it would be more important to actually cook the chicken in the liquid as you're kind of bringing all the ingredients together. Mm -hmm. And of those, I think some of the most interesting are from um, South America. They, they look unbelievable. They're and the Caribbean, like Puerto Rico. Like maybe you could talk about which one? I Those can't. are like the oh, uh, ayaco. Yeah, ayaco and the sopa de pollo. You know, I love South American soups. They, you know, I, I did a lot of um, when I was recipe testing. I would kind of clump them in ingredients, so I would go buy all the ingredients for something that was very similar. And uh, when I got to South America, I was buying a whole different set of ingredients. And it blew my mind how sweet the broths were because you make this broth and you cook, you know, um, uh, plantains or corn or yucca and all of those flavors are so sweet and it is a whole different world of soup. And it's fun because like the corn is, uh, you know, it's little chunks and so you, you have to pick it up to eat it. And it's really a, a, a lovely meal to, to be engaged with. Um, but I thought that the, the South and Central American um, soups were just dynamite. And they eat them every day. They eat them for breakfast. Um, it was, they're, they're amazing. Yeah, I mean, I, I've gotten more into um, savory for breakfast, like dinner for breakfast, um, especially during this, um, during the 2020 period. Um, where, cause I'm cooking for one. So if I made like a, a, a nice soup with a lot of stuff in it for dinner, I would just have it for breakfast as well. And those soups just seems like they would be so delicious for breakfast. A lot of cultures do have soup and, and more savory items than we do. A lot of cultures don't have the, um, uh, the big starchy breakfasts that we do. So um, you see things, you know, more of brothy soups and a little more hearty and those types of things. Okay, I'm going to just throw a couple questions in. Um, an anonymous attendee has asked, what about chicken skin on or off um, when you make the soup? And then I'm going to follow that up with, if off, what would you do with it? You are so good. That's a great question. Uh, Skin is, is important for so many reasons. Um, if you're roasting, it's, it, it renders the fat on the, um, you know, on the chicken when you're roasting it. So it, it makes it uh, a little more moist. This is, this is, this is Silverado Silverstein, by the way, if whoever <laughs> said something about it. Um, so uh, 
I also feel that the same is true if you are cooking chicken for a broth. So I always leave the, the skin on when I'm cooking the chicken. And if I wanna pick the meat off of the chicken for shredding it into a soup, then I, um, um, then I take it off after. Um, it, it keeps, it, when you're cooking the chicken in, in liquid, it really just helps keep it more moist. And the fat that it um, renders is, is flavorful for the broth, but it's, it's very easily skimmed off. And then you can use that for schmaltz, uh, which is in the book and kind of talks about utilizing that schmaltz to make chicken um, soup or, or other things that you can roast potatoes, which is amazing. Uh, and the other part is the, what do you do with the chicken skin? Um, well, um, I, I had this, this section of the back of the book because you always get all these different parts sometimes that you don't know what to do with, with a, a chickens. So there's, there's chicken, there's recipes for my um, chopped chicken liver and chicken liver mousse and gribbonous and um, with skin, it's really fun to um, put them between a couple sheet pans and roast them until they're crispy. And you can use them as chips, you can use them as uh, croutons on a salad, you can, it's basically all that delicious skin that you, um, you pick off when you make a roast chicken, but you can make it with the skin that, uh, that comes off of making soup. Um, we have a question from Marilyn and she is asking, does using kosher chicken make a difference in the taste of the soup? And if so, which do you prefer? For example, would you adjust the salt if you're using a kosher chicken? That's a good point. Um, I don't keep kosher, so I typically don't use kosher meat. Uh, sometimes I feel like kosher chicken can be a little more, um, it can be a little bit drier. Um, and maybe that's because of the koshering process with salt. Um, uh, and yes, I would reduce the amount of salt. You can always add more. Um, it's, it's always less is better because you can always add, but um, um, I don't have a ton of experience cooking with kosher meat. So I'm, I'm not good with that, that answer. Um, I want to talk for a minute about some Asian soups. And um, I want to start off with um, a black chicken because I think there are probably quite a few people who may have never seen a black chicken before. That so was so interesting to cook. I had never cooked one and it's a very, very different chicken. It's, it's uh, really lean. Um, so there's not a lot of that um, um, kind of unctuousness. You don't have that like, like that, you know, that fattiness and that softness that we're used to. It's, um, they also boil their chicken. And that's a very, very Chinese method. Um, they boil it and they boil it hard and um, which doesn't, you know, soften it at all, but that's just part of the, the cooking uh, method. They're considered quite medicinal, aren't they? Yes, yes. And that you, you often cook them with other medicinal uh, mushrooms and jujubes and um, um, dried dates and those types of, of things, ginseng. Well, speaking of ginseng, I have to say one of my favorite soups. Oh. I've, never, I've never made it myself. I know what you're going to say. You are. This one is, is definitely, yes. Find some little Cornish game hens or little tiny chickens and make this. It is such a treat and it's so easy. And oh my gosh, it's so good. This is the Korean san, san yutang. Mm -hmm. Describe describe it because it's it's amazing. I mean, there is so much flavor in this soup. Describe first of all when it's usually eaten in Korea. Um, that's a good point. I don't know if I can remember. Is it summer? Yeah, it's summer. Yes, I <laughs> quizzed. <laughs> during this, it's during that you say that it's, and I never knew that that it's during the summer period when it's the hottest. Right. And so people are eating this soup that is just filled with chili filled with ginseng and they there's lines you say there are lines in restaurants that specialize in this and people are just eating this broth and sweating yeah it's it's really really cool and i had that experience i was in uh um uh hong kong and i had that same experience where there was a really great soup place it is as hot and humid as could be outside 
and you go inside and you eat a big, huge bowl of, of hot, spicy soup. Um, that one is really amazing. So basically it's stuffed with rice, but the rice that you use is sticky rice and it's a glutinous rice. Uh, well, it's not sticky rice, it's uh, glutinous rice or sweet rice. And you soak that overnight so it, it gets a, a good amount of moisture in it. And then you stuff it with some ginseng um, and I think some jujube. Yeah, some ginseng, some, some jujube, a lot of garlic. Oh yeah, so much garlic. And, <laughs> and it's so fun. And you, you shove that in the cavity and you close it up and you, um, uh, you cook that really slowly. And what happens is the uh, moisture from cooking it um, cooks the rice. And if you've ever had sticky rice, sticky rice is the best. It's, um, it, it clings to, to itself and it's really uh, satisfying to eat. And um, you, Korean food is really fun because you always have these different condiments. You can make things spicier or less spicy and they mix salt and pepper together as a, a condiment. So um, it really is, is fun to eat. And I have a, a friend who is Chinese and we went out once for this dish and I watched her um, eat the entire thing, the entire, like there was no meat left on the entire bird with a pair of chopsticks. And I was so impressed. Like it was like life goals to be able to eat something like this, pick every little bit off and have so much, uh, uh, it was fun, fun to watch. So we're talking about rice and you, you have several different um, po rice porridge soups, rice porridges in oh, the bag. yeah. So can you um, just talk through some of them and some of the variations um, that range from like the Filipino arroz caldo to a more Japanese kind of um, porridge or kanji? They're pretty similar. And um, one thing that's really interesting is um, um, in, um, in Thailand, they mostly use broken rice for their soups, their rice soups. And broken rice is jasmine rice that is often like grade B, but it's a shorter grain because it's broken. And I actually really like that. I like it steamed because I think that, um, uh, it, it just got, it sticks, it holds together really well. It's really nice to use chopsticks with and it, it's, um, you know, you can get some sauce in it. Um, so that's really delicious. Um, you know, I think they really, they vary in country by how liquidy they are. So some might be more stiff, some might be softer. In the kanji, which is spelled K-A-N-J-E-E -E, from, um, uh, Sri Lanka. I have a, a friend of mine from high school, his family was from Sri Lanka, and he gave me his family's recipe. And it uses coconut milk and tamarind and curry leaves. And that soup is just fantastic. Like it was, it was, it was one of my absolute favorites. Um, but they're all just a little bit different in, in aromatics. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's the inexpensive food that everybody can eat because it costs very little, little. And for just a tiny bit of rice, you can make a tremendous amount of soup. Um, some have meat in them, some have vegetables, some are very plain. So we have another question. This one is from Joan Presky and she asks, do the recipes vary in terms of time and difficulty? They very much do. So like the yachni that I, I mentioned, um, it's very straightforward. The prep is really easy. Um, it's very easy to put together. Um, and then you have others. There's a, a Japanese um, uh, um, soup that you make noodles and you make this um, egg crepe and you make uh, these marinated mushrooms. And so you have to, you do each step and then you put a bowl together. Um, and the prep is definitely, um, it's, it's labor intensive for sure, but um, they do vary. So there's, there's a huge variation in the book. And I should say that in the book, there are recipes for everything. So in Russian soups that include pelmeni, you have recipes for the, the little stuffed um, dumplings. So there are recipes for every kind of dumpling, every kind of 
pasta or noodle that goes into it. So um, I'm, I'm not suggesting that anybody do this, but- You can, you absolutely can. Like if you went to the grocery store and you could find pomeni, buy them. Um, that that's not a big deal and, and you can go to to lots of um asian stores and find really delicious noodles to use and make it easier i just wanted to have every if i was going to do it from scratch i wanted it to be available but even in the book i talk about you don't have to use a whole chicken if you have broth that you want to use and you have chicken thighs adapt the recipe you can certainly do that um you should just enjoy cooking and enjoy eating the whole thing so having said that um i you talk about simmering and how simmering is really um important to you for the 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 meat because you're basically poaching the meat you're not boiling the meat of the chicken um i make my broth mostly with um backs and necks yes a lot of backs and necks and then wings mm -hmm. for um and when I do a big batch of that, I will sometimes do it in my pressure cooker, in my Instapot, which is very, very high um, heat. Is, is that something that you would ever do? Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you say that. Um, whenever I roast a chicken or if I have bone in thighs or whatever, I always keep the bones after dinner and I just throw them in a container in my freezer. And so um, when it gets full, I'll throw them in my Instant Pot and, um, uh, and cook them. It always makes great broth, but the one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't give me the same uh, texture of broth. And I'm wondering if that's the heat or if it's just, you know, using, you know, bones from a roast chicken. I don't know, um, but I do that for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's no reduction of the broth in an instant mm -hmm. because it's enclosed. So I would imagine that yeah. really affects it. Right. I'm always amazed by how you're not skimming it and yet it comes out so clear at the end. I know it's true. It's very strange, but it's really handy. Like I have an instant pot and I, I haven't, I, I don't use it for very many things. Um, but if I have it, like, especially when I was making all these soups, I would have a bunch of bones and I would just throw them in there. And it was just so simple. Um, so someone, an anonymous someone is asking if you had the chance to explore Cuban soup. Yes. Um, I'm looking it up. So that was that page. That was the ahi, ahi, is it ahiaco or ahiaco? Um, what I understand, it's ahiaco. And, and, and the sopa di pollo. Yeah, they're, um, they're delicious. They're they're really earthy. They're very, they have a very, you know, I'd, I'd say um, South America, Central America, and, um, um, you know, Cuba, Puerto Republic, Puerto Rico. They, they have a lot of very similar soups. Um, sometimes what happens with the soup is you might see Ayaco in several countries. You might see uh, Sancocho in many countries. And the difference is that um, they just might have a different meat or make them with a little bit uh, different. Um, um, uh, I'm going to turn on a light real quick. I've noticed that too. My my lighting has has died. One, one moment. There. Ooh, what a beautiful kitchen. Ah, so much better. I'm sorry, I didn't want to get up before. Um, much better. Okay. So um, they're all really similar. A lot of them have rice and they're, they're lots of similar vegetables, corn, like I said, yucca, um, um, sweet potatoes, a lot of those very earthy, lots of root vegetables. Um, what about the use of culantro? Uh, that's a good question. Um, that you see in uh, Puerto Rico um, and you know maybe Dominican Republic and um, um, Cuba, um, it, it's, it's often hard to find in some areas uh, in the States. And so I usually tell people use cilantro, which is not exactly the same, but um, if you can't find it, you can't find it. So I think cilantro is a good- But we can grow it, those of us who live in- I know you can. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can find specialty seeds because culantro is just so much more assertive and um, 
super aromatic, really interesting um, herb. Um, and there, there's this soup from, I'd love to get into some of the more African cultures. Ah, oh, so um, good. This is, um, but first let's go to Haiti. Yeah. The poulet creole. Yeah, so that was interesting. I didn't know that, um, that soup. And my, one of my uh, uh, line cooks uh, made it for staff meal for everyone. And I was like, this is cool. I've never had this. And, and it's one of those things with chicken soup. Like there's a, there's a, I could have written twice this amount of recipes. There's a lot of chicken soups out there. And um, he made it and it was really delicious. So I, I had to do some research and that's where it came from. One of the things that intrigues me about this recipe is of course it's spicy, but I love how the um, Scotch bonnet chili, which is the, the chili uh, that's used in Haiti, is um, that the chicken is marinated in it before. So you, you're starting out with a chicken that already has this punch to it. Oh yeah, you're, you're, you're not gonna taste the chicken, you're gonna taste the chili. But you know, they, they um, eat so much of scotch bonnet, so, so many uh, foods with scotch bonnet chilies and they're so much more used to it than we are, but it's a very intense flavor. And so I, I kind of recommend dialing it back a little bit if you're not used to them, because it is a very, very um, spicy chili. Um, oh, here's an interesting question. Do you find the stock like, for example, would you use egg whites or some other thing like oh. making a consomme, for example? Yeah, I, I rarely make consomme. Um, it's, it's incredibly, if somebody wants to make it for me, I will happily enjoy it. Um, it's a beautiful soup and it's a beautiful um, experience to be able to, to eat it. And, you know, sometimes you see it um, clarified with uh, uh, egg whites, sometimes with a, a raft, which is like, you take uh, meat and egg, sometimes egg white, and you put it on top. And what happens is all the impurities from the stock go up into the, uh, the raft is what it's called because it kind of sits on the top. And you very, very carefully uh, make a hole when it's done cooking and you take a, the hole out of the raft and you very, very carefully ladle the soup from, um, from the pot. Um, but I don't make it very often. Um, I wouldn't recommend ma making it for any of these soups because you're going to make it and then you're gonna cloudy it up again. So, but um, if you have something else you would like to do with it, it's, it's beautiful. Mafe? Yeah. Yeah. Those are really cool. So African soups are very different um, because again, like, like South America, the palette of ingredients is, is very different. Um, you see a lot of uh, peanut or what they call ground nuts in, um, in African countries, um, thickening soups. Um, a lot of them are also made vegetarian um, because there's not always a lot of, a lot of animal protein around. Um, and um, they just have really lovely vegetables. You can see okra in some and you can see um, potatoes. They're very rich and very heavy but that has to do with the fact that they don't have a lot of money and they need to kind of pack their uh, protein and their richness into, you know, filling their bellies. Yeah, this one, just to run through some of the ingredients to give people an idea, onion, ginger, jalapeno, eggplant, curry powder, chili powder, tomato paste, peanut butter, to tomatoes, and then squash, like butternut squash, zucchini, <laughs> potato, okra. Delicious starches. Yeah, really delicious. Um, Larry is asking, what do you recommend for those that want the comfort and joy of chicken soup but are vegan? Ah, uh, uh, Larry. Um, I'm trying to figure out if that's my sweetheart, Larry. Um, either way, if you are or you're not, um, you can absolutely do these soups and make them vegan. You're not going to have the same experience because uh, you know, obviously there's no meat in it, but the, the, um, a, a broth, vegetable broth is so different from chicken broth. Um, but you can absolutely um, keep the meat out. You can use all the vegetables and all the spices and make a really nice uh, vegetarian 
uh, vegan broth. And there's so many great recipes for, I love eating vegan. I think it's, it's a great way to eat and I love vegetables. Um, so I often will play around with different kinds of broth. Um, I've made some that are kind of funky and have like, like tomato and I've put little kumquats in there to give it a brightness. So you can do something like that. You can make a mushroom broth where you, um, you, you know, put a bunch of like mushrooms in a, um, in a food processor and then start cooking those down with onions really, really far until they're really concentrated. You can add some tomato paste and wine. And then um, sometimes I add fennel fronds into that, a bunch of water and then, and garlic and let that cook for a long time and then strain it and you can get a really rich um, stock. Um, the thing about a broth like that, that I think is so helpful is that it isn't as sweet as just relying on aromatic vegetables. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that, that's, that's totally true. Um, and then you can also use miso. Miso is a wonderful um, kind of umami and gives you some of that um, salty flavor that is savory without having meat in it. So you can, you can do a lot of great things and, and make all, them all vegan. So I'm just gonna go through some more of the questions before we have to wrap up. Um, if you wanna make a collagen rich broth, do you recommend chicken parts, whole chicken, adding additional feet? And does the cook time matter or quantity of chicken to water ratio? Yes, all of that matters. It's a great question. Um, I tend to use, um, like Evan, um, backs and necks and that's what i kind of learned to make when i was learning to make stock uh like i said i don't typically use vegetables in my stock again silverado silver hey. Hey. <laughs> and um and so that's that that to me usually provides enough uh body into um into stock um but if i um, if I want a little bit, I would tend to add wings rather than feet. Feet adds a lot of collagen, but not a lot of flavor. And sometimes, and it's a personal thing. Sometimes for me, that collagen without flavor doesn't sit quite right with me as the texture that I'm looking for, but I can usually get enough, um, um, enough texture in ne necks and backs. And if you, if you want wing tips or wings, um, but the ratio, um, I was original. I was taught a long time ago, and it, it works beautifully for me. Is fill your pot up with uh, bones, whatever you have or whatever you're going to use. Make sure there's some meat attached to them. It doesn't have to be like a whole thigh or anything, but you want to make sure the bones aren't clean. And then um, you fill water to the top of the bones, and that always works for me. So it doesn't matter what kind of pot you're using. It matters how much, uh, how much. Uh, how many bones in the pounds, et cetera. Some people have a very scientific, um, um, you know, for this many pounds of bones, this is the amount of water by grams. I don't think that's necessary at all, so. Um, so here's a comment from Doreen. She says, it would be so nice to open a cafe restaurant with all of your chicken soup from around the world. Any considerations that would be a hit, especially in the Pacific Northwest? Soup Nazi, are you going to become a soup no, Nazi? No, no. I do that out of the back of my car now with all my tent camps that I'm working with. Um, you know, there's so many great ones in here. I'm, I'm, um, uh, oh, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I love Yachni and I think it's really impressive. Um, and I love, one of the things I really love about these soups is that they are, they're rustic for every culture. And they, they say so much about the culture, they taste like the culture, and they kind of exude the personality of, of the place. So I think that's really lovely. Um, you know, I, I, can, I can totally go through the whole book and I would say that most of them I love. There's a few that I'm like, this is kind of weird. Um, there's one that's, that you basically, you toast flour really, really, uh, for a really long time. And then you add water and you make like these noodles and you cook it in broth. Um, it doesn't taste good to me. <laughs> it is, it, it, and it, I don't know if it's a cultural thing, but it just, it tastes like really 
overly cooked flour that makes the soup kind of like a roux and makes it like thick, but it's not tasty to me, but most of them are very, very tasty to me. Um, so, so answer this question then. Yeah. What yeah. chicken soup would you serve to make a main dish for lunch or dinner? Okay, that is a great question. If I was making something for lunch or for dinner and it was for a group of people who I wanted to, um, I'm looking for it, I'm forgetting which one it is. Um, if I had friends coming over or I wanted something really special, I would make, give me one second. Oh, I can't find, oh yes, I, I just found it. The ahiaco from Cuba, because it's really cool. It's a chicken soup, but it also has like dried beef in it. And you can buy this stuff at a, um, uh, like a Latino grocery or a lot of maybe some Asian groceries. And it's almost, it's not even jerky. Like it's not something you'd eat on its own and you have to soak it overnight um, with, some, with some changes of water. And then you put that in the braise and you have so many different vegetables and so many different um, uh, meats and flavors and textures. And you can just make a big pot of it and put the pot on the, um, on the table. And I think it's a really, really cool meal. So one last question. How long did you travel and to how many countries? I really, the uh, I've been really fortunate and I've, I've traveled um, uh, a lot in my life, which has been wonderful. And I, I eat a lot when I travel. Um, so I've, I've learned a lot about food from other cultures. Uh, when you write a book, unfortunately, there's not a lot of, um, of budget for travel. And so unless you're already going somewhere, they don't pay for you to, um, to go to a bunch of places. So a lot of my research uh, was based on uh, my own travel, talking to friends from other cultures. I would put on Facebook, I'll say, great, anybody have a, a chicken soup from the culture that they grew up in? And people would respond to me and they would talk to me and they would send me recipes and coach me through things. Um, um, I would go to lots of um, restaurants um, that serve different kinds of chicken soups. And, you know, one of my favorite stories is I was coming back from a friend's wedding in Tel Aviv and I was on the plane and I was kind of like already tired of traveling and I had just gotten on the plane. So I, I went to sleep and I woke up a little while later and this woman was sitting next to me and she looks over at me and she goes, hi, my name's Hanan. I'm a Christian Palestinian, the peaceful kind. Literally, those are the words that she used. <laughs> and so I looked at her and I just woken up and I'm like, hi, I'm Jen. I'm an American Jew, the peaceful kind. <laughs> and we had the best talk. It was the most fun. And as she lives in, in San Jose. I don't have her contact information, but without me even asking her about the chicken soup, she came out and told me her mom's Palestinian chicken soup recipe. And it was really cool because it was one of those things where it just happens and you learn. And uh, she told me exactly how her mom makes it, the textures, how much rice goes in, you know, so, so you're looking for, you know, that it, it should have rice in it, but just a little bit. So you're just using a couple spoonfuls. And, um, you know, I, I came home, I, I wrote down like all the little details. I went home and I made it and um, it's in the book and it's, uh, it's pretty special. So I just want to say that before you actually open this book, when you have it at home, make sure you have a chicken in the house. Oh, that's so nice. And some vegetables, because every time I open this book, as I have to prep for this conversation, the urge to immediately get in the kitchen and make some of these and taste them is overwhelming, which is like the best compliment I could ever give a cookbook. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. This has been so much fun. And I want to thank everyone at, um, at the Skirball for being so lovely to us and for setting up this, um, this encounter. Um, Jen, would you like to come with the other Jen, Jen Maxi? Can I real quick just say that I have all my books. They, they, um, they're all on my website, jenlewis.com. 
and I will sign them and uh, ship them out if you're interested. And you can go to jenlewis.com to uh, order. Thanks. I think this is a great soup to bring to a Passover dinner as a gift. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, you're right. That's great. That's a great idea. Evan, thank Evan. you so much. And Jen, thank you. I was going to mention your website, so I'm glad you did. Jen, <laughs> uh, self-promotion. <laughs> so, no, no. Um, gosh, I just, I, you know, we, don't we all just want to go make soup right now? I mean, that was so inspiring and what a, what a wonderful way to like experience the world, you know, and understand kind of like the comfort that we all find in, in the ingredients that we put together in a soup. It's just beautiful. What a wonderful talk and program. I can't thank you both enough. Um, also, for those of you out there who may be interested in our upcoming programs, please come and visit us at skirball.org. We have book programs coming up. We have music coming up. We have film um, for foodies out there. It's it's a couple months away, but we do have Jake Cohen coming. If you like Jewish food, it was his cookbook, Jew. Oh, Ed. he is the best. He so is so such a wonderful, kind human. He is so lovely. Thank you. Well, Jen, I'm going to tell him you give, gave him a good shout out. Please do. He is such a lovely person. So uh, Jake, Jake and Michael Twitty will come to us in June. So please oh, that is, that is something very special. <laughs> good. Will you be here? Good. Okay. Oh my God. Yeah. If I, I, I have never actually been in the same room as Michael. I've only talked to him from far away. Oh, good. Well, maybe we can, I don't know. We'll, we'll talk. And okay. Then we'll get a little something going. Okay. So anyway, that's coming up. We uh, look forward to seeing you all at the Skirball. We thank you so much for being here. We do hope that soon enough, we're going to be able to welcome people back to our campus when it is safe to do so. And until that time, just everyone take good care and make some wonderful soup. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you it. everyone.